but if you are doing wildlife biology in second semester, then I coordinate that unit, so we'll be seeing a whole lot more of each other then. Um, just a heads up, there are field trips for wildlife biology, so there's a three-day field trip that you do either in the first non-teaching break or the second non-teaching break, so just so that you know, so you can organise your life in second semester around that. Um, and if you want further details of those field trips, then get in touch with me um, and I can let you know. Uh, and you'll be allocated to either one or the other, um, depending on your needs and the preferences of everyone in the class uh, early in the semester. So again, if you need further info or you've got special reasons for doing one or the other, then get in touch with me um, sooner rather than later. And that's my email address up there. Right, remind me not to look at this clock um, because that's going to lead me astray. Uh, and we've got quite a lot to get through today. Basically, today's lectures are all about biological diversity. Um, and it's a bit of a buzzword, it has been for a while. Um, but as biologists, we really need to not just have a vague understanding of it being different types of things, but we need to really have a very deep understanding of what it means and more importantly, how we go about measuring it, how we go about quantifying it. Um, and it's really important that we quantify it because um, if we can measure it, then we can figure out maybe what factors are affecting it or driving it so that we can figure out what leads to high rates of diversity or low rates of diversity, and then we can manage those factors appropriately to try and increase biodiversity. So in terms of today, the first half is really about defining what the components are, and then looking globally to how many species there are, that's one way of measuring it, and then looking at species richness and area, richness and geographic scale, and they're all ways of measuring biodiversity at the species level, and then looking at some patterns around species richness, both in ecological time, but also across Earth's history, uh, across geological time as well, to give us some, some perspective. And then we're going to move on, we're going to change tab about halfway through the lecture, and we're going to move on to talk just at the species level about what makes species rare and how can we use those attributes of rarity to help us classify species according to their threatens, threatened status? Uh, and then towards the end, you use those components of rarity and look at other biological phenomena about species and try to figure out if there are any correlates for extinction risk. What are the things that um, lead to a heightened risk of species becoming threatened or in fact going all the way down the gurgler to extinction. Uh, and then right at the end, I'd like to look back again into geological history and look at extinctions in the fossil record so that we can get a bit of perspective from the past that gives us a window through which we can look at what really is described as a current extinction crisis. Some would describe it as we're going to a sixth mass extinction. So we have, we have a lot to do. So let's kick off. Components of biodiversity. Um, now when we think of biological diversity, we do think of different types of things. And really when we think about that in our minds, mostly we're thinking at the species level, we're thinking about different species because it's easy for us and other people to visualise what a species is. At least in our minds, biologists have lots of arguments about how they define species. Um, but we get the idea, it's easy to understand, it's the level at which the biological hotspots around the world are defined in terms of numbers of different species, species richness. Um, and it's the legal unit of conservation. Our environmental legislation protects species and to a certain extent ecological communities as well now but really it's focused at the species level. So species is often where we have our focus, and in fact, that's where we're gonna to focus today. But what you need to also appreciate, and what we all do, is that there are levels of diversity below that, and also above the species level. 
So it goes from the full spectrum of diversity at the genetic level, at the gene level, right through to the species level and right up to ecosystem diversity. Um, and in terms of genetic diversity, we're talking here about the differences between individuals, the different alleles that they hold at each of the loci that those organisms have, and therefore the variation that's held within populations, and the fact that if we look to different populations, there might be different levels of variation and different types of variation. So there might be some genetic structure in the way uh, that that diversity is held between populations. And you've had some information, I think, from Mike last week. Did you have something on population biology? Yes. And you're going to get more information on genetics from Peter later in semester. But just to appreciate right now that the population is really an important level of diversity because it's where evolution has happened. Evolution has led to the current levels of variation that are held within species. And that's really important because that's the variation that's going to enable those populations to change and adapt and respond to changing environmental conditions in the future. So that's a really important part of diversity that we need to capture, otherwise species won't persist in the long term. Um, and it also gives us some practical tools in terms of conservation. If we want to translocate species into a former part of their range from which they've become locally extinct, then if we have information on genetics, we know where to source those individuals from to translocate. So species is our focus today. We're going to talk about richness. That's the number of different species. We're also going to touch on abundance, which is the number of individuals of each of those species, so population size, if you will. Endemism, things that are found only in one specific area. Uh, and taxonomic diversity. Taxonomic diversity is really important. So for example, in a grassland, there might be um, a large range of different species, but most of them are going to come from one family. In a Banshee woodland, though, there's a range of different species that might come from 10 or more different families, from um, the ground la layer through the middle story and different species and families in the upper canopy as well. So taxonomic diversity is important. And Species richness and taxonomic diversity is also important in terms of community function. So it's not just a number of different things that we need, but we need things that are really important contributors to ecosystems. So for example, Western Australia, as you may well know, is a plant diversity hotspot. Our common <coughs> heathland and scrubland that, that grows on the sand plains around the coast of southwest WA has really high species richness in terms of plants. And what that means is that there are different plants that are staggered in their flowering times, which give year-round food sources for nectar-feeding birds and for mammals. So the ecosystem function of the plants is really supporting the diversity of the animals. So that's an important part of species diversity as well. And then we need lots of different types of ecosystems or habitats. We need tundra, we need rainforests, we need quangan heathland, we need deserts, we need eucalypt forests, and lots of different types of um, communities and ecosystems that we can serve across the globe. So we need that diversity at a, at a landscape scale as well. One of the simplest ways, well, it seems simple, but it's not actually simple, uh, to measure species richness is to ask how many species are there across the globe. Uh, and there was a study done a decade ago now, the Australian Biological Resources Study. This was a paper that was published by a fellow named Chapman. And he, he looked across a whole range of different books and journal articles and other resources that are published and estimated that there is about 1.9 living, million living species that have been named or described so far and about 300,000 fossil species. Now that estimate is hard to get because there's not one place where you can go and it'll tell you how many there are. And that's the ones that have actually been taxonomically described. There's, there's possibly 
um, a morphological description of them, there's a scientific name attached with them. They're those ones. There's a whole lot more out there that have been uh, yet to be discovered or yet to be described um, in a taxonomic sense. And the estimates for how many species there really are, including the ones we don't know about yet, are really widely variable, so from 5 to 80 million species, possibly on Earth. So here's some data breaking those numbers now down into the different taxonomic groups. Um, and if you have a look here in this table, with, can you see that pointer? No. We've got total described species in the world for the different groups. The estimate of how many is there is thought to be, including the ones that we don't know about, um, and the percent that we've described. So for mammals, we've got just shy of um, 5,500 species in total described. There aren't that many more that we don't know about. We don't discover new mammal species very often. So we think we've got a pretty good handle on the mammals. We're almost at 100% description with them. For the birds, a little bit less than 10,000. It's estimated there's about 10,000 species in the world. So again, we're doing pretty well in terms of describing the birds. Reptiles, pretty good. Amphibians, not quite as good. So we're doing pretty well. The mammals, however, make up 0.1% of all the species in the world, it's estimated. So we're doing really well with them, but they're actually a very small group of the total diversity. If you have a look down the list here to insects, we reckon we've described about a million of those species, but it's estimated that there might be five million insect species. And so we've really only got a handle on a fifth of the species richness in that group. And yet, they make up about 65% of the world's sanding species richness. If you continue on down the list, um, you see total described for other groups. We're doing pretty well um, with the plants, about 76% of those. But then you look down to algae and fungi and to prokaryotes, and we're doing appallingly with those. And yet fungi is estimated to make up about 8% of the world's standing species richness. So uh, we're, we're nowhere near really even knowing how many species there are in the world. These two points at the top here are the same as the previous slide. So I guess the diversity in many groups is largely undescribed. And the other point to make would be that even where we have a name for things, a large number of them, that's all we have. A name and a description, a basic description. We don't know anything about their other biology and ecology, like their distribution, how they reproduce, how many offspring they have, how long they live for, some of the other life history traits, um, how many there are in terms of population size, all really important things that you need to know if you're trying to assess them for their threatened status or their conservation status. Okay, so let's have a look at some of that data now. So this is the percent we've described again, percentage threatened in the world in Australia and percentage endemic. So uh, looking to the mammals, you see that they're pretty high up there on this list in terms of the percentage threatened. But again, that's because we know most about them. So we're able to say whether or not they're threatened. Um, and you'll notice that the level of endemism in our, our mammals is really, really high. In fact, in all of our um, animals and plants for Australia, the levels of endemism are really high. So what we have in Australia is really unique. So we've got a high percentage of mammals threatened, but especially if you compare that to the figure for across the world. And so things that we're that are threatened or that might become extinct in Australia because they're only found here and they're so unique, that means that that extinction is a global extinction if we lose something from Australia, more likely than not. Um, if you go further down the list, you notice that <clears throat> fish seem to be doing pretty well and we know a decent amount about them. Um, but insects, 
mollusks, um, plants, we know quite a lot about them, um, algae. Some of these things have quite low rates of threatened species. But again, that's because we don't actually know very much about them. So if we don't know they even exist, if we haven't described them, then we can't assess them for threatened status. So the point that we can take away from this slide is that we might have already lost things or we might be losing things that we never knew even existed. And so it's really important that we have this basic taxonomic information. Okay, so leaving global richness, mostly when we talk about species richness, we're talking about how many species are there in one particular location. And we usually express that as the number of species per unit area. Sometimes we like to express it per time, so we might set out some remote sensing cameras, for example, or we might like to say how many species we, we captured in the period of time that the cameras were out, so we might say per unit time, per unit effort. Um, plant species richness in the southwest is really high. Fitzgerald River National Park, which is on the south coast, um, of this state in between Albany and Esperance is a large um, UNESCO listed national park. It's about 300,000 hectares and it has 2,000 species, plant species present in that national park. So it's, it's recognised for its um, biodiversity values. Sometimes we might want to say the number of species per specified number of individuals or in a specified volume of, say, water, invertebrate species in one litre of water that we sample from a wetland, or insects in 100 grams of leaf litter that we collect from the forest floor. Um, or we might want to say how many there are in an evolutionary lineage. So our number um, that's unique to the southwest is so unique that it's a single member of its own family. Whereas in the Miridae family of rodents, there are like 600 different species of rodents in that family. So you're getting the idea that we express species richness per unit time or area or effort in order that we can compare things. And usually what we're doing is, well often what we're doing is, is comparing locations. So we're trying to look at how species richness varies across different sites, looking at spatial variation. Um, and we might also want to look at how it varies over time as well. So we might put in some kind of conservation action, for example, excluding invasive species, and we want to see how the native plant species richness responds to that. So we might take some measures of species richness over time. Or we might want to look in response to disturbances like, like fire. Um, and anything that happens in terms of clearing or development in this country has to be approved by the federal government and also by the state, a range of state departments. And to get those approvals for impacting on areas of native habitat, um, the proponents have to go through an environmental impact assessment. And Figuring out which species are there and how many of them is the core of that environmental impact assessment. So it's a very important measure, um, kind of the bread and butter for what a lot of environmental consulting or ecological consulting work is about. Okay, and the answer that we get in terms of how many species are there will differ according to the effort that we put in. And you will have seen this, you would have maybe even made your own um, graph like this. Um, I'm calling it a species area relationship, you could call it a species accumulation curve or a species area curve. Um, you might have in environmental biology gone down the back to the Bankshire woodland um, and looked at plant species richness, maybe put a plot, <coughs> say a two square metre plot down um, and had a look at how many species of plant were in that plot and noted them down and counted them and then maybe moved along on your transect and, and um, popped your, your um, plot down again and had a look at the species that were in the new location. And you might have seen some that you saw in the first location 
and you might see some new ones. So you add those to your total. And as you go along, you add up the cumulative number of species that you've seen across the increasing area that you've sampled. Um, and we expect that, that as the area sampled increases, that the number of species that we see will also increase to a point. And what we hope at some point is that this curve plateaus. So at that point of inflection and once it plateaus, then we know we've sampled enough area to have seen all of the species that are present there. So that tells us that we've, we've put in enough effort. But the shape of that curve is going to differ depending on um, the location that we're in. So this is species area curves for a couple of sites in Quangum Heathland in Western Australia, Samplain Heathland, versus trees found at a, a number of sites in a rainforest in Borneo. And you can see the shape of those two curves are very, very different. So the Quangum is four and five. There's incredible diversity. 100 different species are found in 0.1 of a hectare. That's the size of an Olympic swimming pool. 100 different plant species found there, all squashed together, mixed together in that one location. But you can see as they sample more and more area of Congo, they don't find any more plant species. So that's saying that the area is very, very diverse. In a very small area, there's a large number of small plants that are coexisting, but across the larger area, it's very homogenous. You don't find any more species. In the Borneo rainforest, though, also high diversity. You get 100 different species in not much more than 0.1 of a hectare. But then it just keeps going up and up and up and up as you sample more and more area. So overall, the species richness is much higher, but the curve hasn't really plateaued. So that tells us that in this situation, they haven't sampled enough area to really have got a reasonable, decent answer about how many species there are. But it also tells us that conserving small pockets of rainforest is really in inadequate because you're not capturing the total number of species that are present. It's obviously quite heterogeneous across the broader landscape. So it gives us some clues about reserve design as well, which I'll talk about in a sec. So sampling effort is important <clears throat> across space and also across time. So this is some reptile data looking at five different sites um, out in the desert in Western Australia uh, and expressing the species richness per unit effort in terms of time. So they're capturing these reptiles in pitfall traps, which are essentially buckets that are dug into the ground at ground level and the reptiles walk along and fall in. And then the researchers come back um, from, you know, maybe twice a day and take the animals out, measure them, weigh them, um, perhaps mark them, identify them and release them. And to give you an idea, one bucket open for one day is one pit trap day. If you had 100 buckets open for one day, that would be 100 pit trap days. If you had those 100 open for two days, that would be 200 pit trap days. And you keep adding on the number of traps that you have open each day. Um, and you can see here the effort at these sites ranges from about 2,000 pit trap days through to over 40,000 pit trap days. So that's having, 40,000 is having 100 pit traps open for 400 days. So more than a year's worth of sampling. That's an incredibly huge effort. And when you look at <coughs> that site, you can see that actually it doesn't actually reach a plateau. But after all that time, after a year's worth of sampling, they still don't have an answer on species richness for that particular site. This graph here is, is expressing number of species per number of individuals, which is quite relevant for reptiles because the weather is going to depend. If it's quite cloudy, then you're not going to, reptiles are not going to be active, so you want to catch as many. So expressing it per number of individuals for is a, is a good way to do it um, for reptiles. So you can see most of those sites there have sort of started to get to the point of inflection that they're not actually plateauing. This red sand sites, so it looks like it starts to plateau, but then it just keeps creeping upwards and upwards and upwards very, very slowly. And at that red sand site, we have a look at the abundance of species. So this is relative abundance. It's the percentage of 
that each species makes up of the total number of individuals. You can see that there are about 17 species that range from maybe 2% through to 18%. And then there's a tail of species here that have only maybe one or two individuals captured in the sampling time. So there's a large number of very rare species and that's why that species area curve just keeps creeping up, creeping up, creeping up and more and more time goes on because it increases the chances that you, you pick up these very rare species in the tail of the distribution there. So there's a couple of things that can affect the shape of that curve, spatially in terms of heterogeneity, but also the relative abundance, the rarity or the commonness of the species that you have that you're sampling in the community. Okay. So, it sounds like a boring exercise in sampling, but it's not boring because it's highly relevant to conservation. Um, <clears throat> so, this is showing forest habitat in southwestern Victoria and it's showing um, the clearing that's occurred between 1942 through to 1980. You can see the reduction in forest habitat and also the fragmentation there. And what we wind up with is habitat patches that are sort of probably most of them sitting around um, one to two kilometres square or less. Um, so that's about 100 hectares or less. And there's been a similar pattern, of course, in WA in our wheat belt area in the last half of last century and there's a similar pattern that's occurred in the southeast of Victoria as well and that's where this bird data is from. So this is a species area curve. The x-axis here is um, on a log scale. So looking at the number of different species per size of patch, of forest patch, and it tells us an important thing that we, that we know, that we hope will always happen is that as the size of the patch increases, we see a greater number of species in larger, in larger patches. But it also shows us something else. Up here, so at 100 hectares, we're seeing about, whatever that is, 60, 65 species present in those sites. If we look at sites that are 10 times larger, so 1,000 hectares, we're not getting very many more species present there. And so that tells us that these areas of 100 hectares in size, rather than saying, oh, they're too small, let's not worry about them, they're not very valuable, they're very, very valuable because what they're giving us is 90% of the species richness in 10% of the area. So it gives us some important information about how valuable these remnant patches are. Now, as I'm saying that, what I'm hoping is that you're thinking, yeah, but hang on a minute, hang on a minute, there are other problems with conserving small areas and just taking simple counts of species richness. So let's think about what some of these things are and just call them out as as you think of them. So what are some of the, the issues or the caveats around just simply counting the number of species and using that as the basis for conservation decisions? You don't know the abundance of species, so it could be quite low and then the gene pool would be quite low. Yeah, so abundance of species being low, and that's a problem because Absolutely. What else is a problem with small population size? It's kind of risky in terms of ongoing viability, isn't it? Reproduction <coughs> of the population. <coughs> Genetic diversity. Where are you, sorry? Oh. Genetic diversity? Absolutely. Yeah, if you've only sampled a very small number of individuals, you're only capturing a small amount of that genetic variation, so that's going to be a problem for the future ongoing um, ability for that population to adapt when environmental conditions change. Other issues around just 
using simply the total number of species as our measure. Do you know how many females there are? Yeah. They could just be all males and that's not going to conserve the population. Absolutely. You need to have a reproductively operatable population with a sex ratio that's appropriate to that. Yep. not descriptive enough in the sense that we might have like a hundred species in an area but we don't know how many individuals per species yes so we've, we've yeah we've talked about that sort of in terms of abundance yeah so not just a single species but yes we need to know how many for all the species are there absolutely and then we need to know things about relative abundance don't we why would that be important single versus <coughs> Group populations and in relation to between species and other species, and just competition or creation or any of those things. Yes, we need to know what those species are, what their interrelationships are, uh, predator prey relationships, host disease relationships, all those kinds of complexities. <coughs> A very good point. And, and that brings us to one of the things that I've got down here, uh, which, we, which is that we need information on species composition, relative abundance, and the importance of species in terms of their functional role. So there might be a key species in that ecosystem, and it doesn't matter if we can serve all the rest, if we don't have that one, it might mean that the ecosystem is going to kind of collapse. There's a bench here in Fitzgerald River National Park that's a Banksia Newtowns and it's really low growing bushy Banksia and it has rather than really bright, bright coloured Banksia cones that stick up in the air to attract birds, it has kind of dark brown fuzzy Banksia cones that sit within the bush and it's a really good source of nectar and pollen for nectar feeding mammals. And it flowers over a crucial period of time in summer and if that species was to disappear from that area the, the amount of food there would be very, very little. So it's a, it's a key species that plays a key role in that ecosystem. Um, I think we've got most of the other points here. Um, maybe this one in terms of disturbance. You know, sometimes after disturbance we might see, say, a fire, we might see invasion of weed species come in. Um, and so the species richness in that one location might increase. But if those same weed species are invading all of the other areas across the landscape as well, we might see across the landscape actually a lower native plant species richness. And of course, we need to be sure that we've got the right answer, that we've sampled enough area to give us a decent answer, and as we've established, that can be difficult. So there are some, there are some caveats, but it remains a really useful and key piece of information that's, that's used. The other thing we can do, of course, is we can look at some other indices. So we can look at species richness and adjust it for sample size. And by sample size, I mean the number of individuals. So that's what N is there. S is for species richness. You don't need to remember these equations. It's just to kind of have an appreciation there that there are other indices. And if you need to use them, then you go and um, look them up at the time. You might have come across the Shannon Weiner Index, perhaps in your ecology studies. This is a species diversity index that actually counts the number of species but also takes into account their relative abundance as well. So it takes in some info about population size. And the, the index will go up with a greater number of species and with more even abundances of each of those species. And that index actually ranges between zero and the log of the maximum number of species. But what you can do is convert that into an evenness value. So you take the diversity index and you divide it by the maximum value, which is the log of the number of species. Um, and it gives you an index which ranges from zero to one. And it tells you about how evenly spread the individuals are across the number of taxa, the number of species that you have. So it tells you whether one species is dominating or whether actually the abundances are more even. 
<clears throat> this is some data, just as a really simple example. Sorry, I just need to wet my throat. Um, that we have, we, this is information we collected in wildlife biology a few years back. I mean, it's looking at mammal species at two different lakes. Now, if we look at species richness here, at Lake Black now that we've got just two species, <clears throat> and at Loch Ness we've got three. So if we just looked at species richness, simple species richness, we'd say that Loch Ness had the higher diversity. But when you actually calculate the Shannon Winer Index and then the evenness, you actually see that the values for diversity and especially for evenness are much higher at Nowagup than they are for Loch Ness. And that's because it's saying that, okay, we've only got two species, but their abundances are very even. At Loch Ness, we've got three, but really most of the individuals are the native bush rat, that is fossils. So we've got a very uneven population there. So these types of indices allow us to capture this other information that we're after and can be really useful. They're most useful where you've got a really large number of species in a community. Okay, what we've been talking about What we've been talking about so far uh, is really what's referred to as alpha species richness. That's the species richness in one location, in one, one habitat, at one study site. And that doesn't mean that you can't have various subsamples. So you might, like your Banshee Woodland study that you did for environmental biology, you might have maybe 20 different samples or drought pots that you've taken, that you've measured within that one site but you're really just referring to the richness at that one study site. If, for example, in that study you, you got your answer for species richness in the Banksia woodland of Murdoch, but then you went south a couple of kilometres into the Billy Regional Park, and you did the same thing. You laid down your plots, you might, have done 20, you might do 20 of those, um, and you look at the plant species richness, and you would see some of the same species that you saw at Murdoch, and you'd see some new ones. And it might be that there's some species at Murdoch that don't occur further down the road. And then you might keep going along your big long transect all the way down to the end um, of the lake's habitat and banks you would land. So that's what we call beta species richness. It's looking at the change in the species composition between habitats, so looking across multiple sites. It's looking at the change in the suites of species that are present and the overall standing species richness. And it might be, in that example, it might just be a change due to simple distance or there might be some other kind of environmental gradient, differences in soil type. If you did a big long transect from through the Jarrah Forest, from up in the hills around Perth all the way down to the southwest, if you did that and you looked at beta richness, then you might see differences according to perhaps rainfall, other differences in climate. Um, you can look at um, gradients across altitude. And so you can look at the change in that standing richness. Gamma richness is looking at much larger scales. So it's looking at how many species are there across the whole wheat belt or across the gold fields or on a regional scale, like how many species are there in the southwest <coughs> of Australia. There's about 8,000 different plant species in the southwest, and that's why it's described as a hotspot. So alpha is in one location, gamma is across the whole region, and beta is really what links the two. What's the mosaic, what's the heterogeneity, what's the turnover in the species richness as you move from one location to the next? And just so that you know that this is not something esoteric that you can't get your head around. Actually, you've probably done a measure of beta richness before. Um, there's lots of different ones. These are some of them. Again, you don't need to remember these, but just to give you a sense of the fact that you can actually calculate them quite simply. This is um, a, a coefficient of similarity. And this is one you probably did use in environmental biology. 
So A here in this equation is the number of species that's common to both site 1 and site 2. And B is the number of species that's specific to site 1. And C is the number of species that's specific to site 2. So you're basically saying how many species do they have in common over the total number of species? And that gives us our coefficient of similarity. And that's a measure of feature richness. How similar are these two sites? Um, other people do things like they take, uh, they, they measure the total richness, gamma richness, relative to the local alpha richness. So they say, what's the total gamma richness and divide that by the mean of the alpha richness at each of the sites that they've sampled. Or they take gamma richness and they subtract the mean alpha richness away. So total versus site specific. Okay, and you're going to learn more, I think you've got to develop more of a develop case study later in the semester, I believe, about reserve design. But just to touch on how measures of beta richness are important in this respect, one of the decisions um, often is around acquiring new nature reserve, conservation estate. And should we enlarge the reserve that we have currently to make it larger in area? Or should we leave it alone, leave it as the size that it is? And should we maybe then put into conservation reserve a number of other sites that are distant but near enough by that perhaps organisms can move between them? So do we have one large reserve or do we have several smaller reserves of equal total area. Um, and the argument against the smaller reserves is often the one around patchiness and habitat fragmentation. We know that that has negative effects on fauna and flora. But some of the positives, if we think about the species area relationship and how important that is, um, some of the positives are we know that at some point there's going to be a plateau in the species area curve. So what if in our one large reserve, by making it larger, we actually didn't see any more species? So our species richness didn't increase. But if, if we had several smaller reserves and each of them had different suites of species, then overall our total gamma richness, if you like, um, may be more with um, several smaller reserves rather than one large reserve in a single location. So maybe in each of those smaller reserves we might have lower alpha richness, but if there's high turnover, if we have high beta richness, then overall we might be better off. We might be capturing and conserving more of the species. So that's something, something to think about in terms of catch, capturing that heterogeneity. want to have a look at an example of beta richness that has, it's a hypothetical example but it has numbers in it so it makes it easier to get your head around. There's one in the pre-mat textbook on page 33 if you want to go and have a look at that at another time. Okay. So we've covered these four so far, measures of species richness. Let's just have a look now um, at species turnover. What we've been talking about in terms of geographic scale is really spatial turnover. So this is just a marker slide to say, yep, we've got turnover in space and we've talked about that. It can be due to distance, increasing geographical area, or it could be because of some topographical or climatic gradient. It could be something to do with um, human stresses, human induced stresses. And it's the change in the suites of species but also in the overall standard richness as well. And when we go out and measure richness, sometimes it's tempting to think, yep, got that, our species area curve tells us we've got a plateau, our sampling effort's good, we've got an answer for that particular area. And we can forget that actually ecological systems don't stand still in time, that the species richness can actually change uh, on temporal scales as well. 
And so here we're talking about things like expansions or retractions of species ranges. So they might add into or fall out of the count that you have for species richness. It can be around transient or migratory species and the way that they move around the landscape. So you may capture or not capture them in your count, depending on what time you sample. Uh, and it can be due to things like seasonal changes. So what are some of the things that might mean that a species moves out of an area or moves into an area? What can induce some of those changes? Climate. Sorry? Climate. Climate, yep. Yeah. Weather can change. Migratory species, you know, move from Siberia down to um, the northern parts of Australia and also the southern parts of Australia to get away from that bad weather. And that's related to what? Not just because they don't like the cold, but to food availability, yep. Yeah. So resources, changes in resources can drive that. Um, and there aren't very many as many studies of species switches around changes in time, and particularly long-term studies. There's one um, interesting one from Rottnest Island that was done last century, and there are four different survey periods that span a time of 79 years, and they looked at the land breeding birds that were present in that time. And they found that there were three extinctions and 10 immigrations onto Rottnest Island in that 79 years. But they also discovered that all of the extinctions and seven of the immigrations were influenced by humans, as in the birds were deliberately introduced or there was clearing of habitat which led to extinction. But that three out of the 17 species that they assessed were actually natural immigrations. So three out of the 17 um, represent um, spatial turnover in, uh, sorry, species richness turnover in time. And the red-necked abyssal um, was one of those it's one of those birds also the oyster catcher both shorebirds um, and the western jerigony which is a small um, uh, bush bird if you like another example of change through time this is um, data looking at sites in New Zealand and looking at estuarine benthic communities um, and what they did here is they had five different sites the first five graphs here, and they popped down 12 block grids at each of these sites. And inside every grid cell, the 12 grid cells, they took a core sample of mud and then they took that away to identify the organisms that were present. And they did that four times a year for 12 years. So they had all of these samples. And what's, what do you notice here? What stands out straight away? So this is alpha richness, average alpha richness at each of those sites for each of those sampling time points. Is it static? No. There's lots of noise, well I'm calling it noise, lots of change in there, isn't there? Lots of variability over time. These are the averages, um, the seasonal averages. And you can see here that a couple of these sites are actually always, these two here, are always higher in their species richness than the others. And that's because those sites were quite different in terms of heterogeneous, in terms of their soil, and they were closer to the ocean, which led to different environmental conditions. The authors of the paper say that there seems to be sometimes a seasonal trend of species richness being higher in spring and summer, but I can't actually really pick that from that data. There doesn't seem to be a clear seasonal trend to me. Um, or if there is, it's not the same at all of, or at all of the sites. But the point being that the answer you get if you came and sampled this site at that time location only, you get a very different answer to if you came then. You need to appreciate in terms of the sampling that aspect of turnover in time. Now that's turnover in ecological time, so years and decades. There's also turnover in terms of species richness in geological time as well. So the Earth's been around for 4.6 billion years um, and the species that have been present on Earth have changed dramatically in that time and the standing richness has also changed and that has waxed and waned. And that waxes and wanes because of 
differences in speciation and extinction rates. So we're not talking about changes in range expansions and contractions here, we're talking about the evolutionary processes of speciation and extinction. This is the geological time scale here. Um, and this is actually an, an old diagram, but I like it because it shows the relative time periods. From 4.6 billion years ago, um, there was a long pre-Cambrian time period to where there was an explosion of multicellular life. So from 4.6 billion years ago, it took until 3.5 billion years ago for the first prokaryotic cells, and then around 2.2 for eukaryotic cells, and then 1.2 billion years ago is where the first filamentous multicellular algae show up. But multicellular plant and animal life really didn't take off until just below the base of this Cambrian period here. So, I guess a lot was happening. I was going to say not much is, was happening, but probably a lot was happening, but just not in terms of multicellular life for a very, very long time um, in Earth's history. And then, <clears throat> this is a more recent diagram which gives you some more updated names. I'm not sure if you can read them from there, but... Basically, this is showing from the base of the Cambrian. So there was an explosion in diversity just before that time. And then there was another period of proliferation that happened throughout the Paleozoic. So this was a proliferation mostly in marine life. Um, but then we started to see in the Ordovician the, the plants come onto land, and then the insects come onto land, and then the tetrapods coming onto land in the Devonian. And then uh, at the end, of that um, era, there was the largest mass extinction that has ever occurred on Earth at the end of the Permian period. Um, and then there was another proliferation of life throughout the Mesozoic. Um, and that included the proliferation of the flowering plants, and then a bit later, of course, the mammals and the birds. And then right at the end, right up here in the last 100,000 years is when Homo sapiens start to, to show up. Um, and just to put <clears throat> us into our, our place, I'll just read you this quote. As an analogy, if that first age is represented by one year, the first life appears in late March, the first marine animals make their debut in late October, the dinosaurs become extinct and the mammals begin to diversify on December 26. The human and chimpanzee lineages diverged at about 13 hours before midnight on December 31, and the common era dating from the birth of Christ begins about 13 seconds before midnight. So we're, we're right at the end there, shave off the end, which really does put us in our place. Okay, so this, this diagram here is showing those three periods of proliferation. So where we're seeing an increase, this is marine families, but it could represent marine species. So where we're seeing an increase here, that's because speciation rates are higher than extinction rates. Um, and then you see these little dips at the end of each of um, the periods, and they represent extinction events. So each of those periods in the geologic time scale represent um, a unique suite of species that can be seen in the fossil record. And so they're described based on that unique set of species and that species richness. Um, uh, you can see this mass extinction at the end of the Permian. And notice here, after that extinction event, uh, species richness starts to recover, but it takes about 100 million years for it to regain the richness that it had before that extinction event. That was an extinction event when about 95% of the species on Earth became extinct. It's not the one that um, the dinosaurs became extinct in, that's at the end of the Cretaceous. What you also notice from this diagram here is that we currently, present day, have a larger number of species extant on Earth than we have at any other time in Earth's history. Um, and so we've got evidence for marine plants that species richness has increased to the present day. We also 
sorry, marine invertebrates. Did I say plants? This is plants. Um, they also concur, so they show an increase in species richness and obviously a change in the composition of the different types of plants that are present. But overall, we have more now than we've ever had at any other time. However, we have more extant now than at any other time. But what we have now represents only 1 to 10% of the diversity that has ever evolved on Earth. And so the corollary of that is that 90 to 99% of all of the species that have ever evolved have already become extinct. So extinction is very normal, somewhat normal, very normal in terms of geological history. Okay, I want to take a break there, um, just for five minutes. Feel free to go away and we'll reconvene in five minutes' time.